Okay, Dar, I'm just going to do a really quick introduction, okay? All right. Make sure you start the broadcast, too. Oh, yeah, that's important, right? Okay. And when you start, going to invite or uh, welcome your guests that are tuning in live, just saying, like, hey, we're live. Thanks for joining us, and go for it. Okay. <sighs> All right, so this is a really new thing for me. Uh, I did a public talk earlier this year in April, and that was uh, a good experience for me to realize that I actually could do something like this, that I could engage in an o with an audience and have a conversation about subjects that I feel need to be discussed in this time that we're in. Um, so doing a live podcast is a bit of a dream come true, but the subjects that we're going to discuss are going to be a bit heavy and difficult. Uh, so. The idea, of course, is to open it up to audience participation. So just to give you a layout of how this is going to work, uh, first I'm going to be speaking with Dar Jamel, who we've got here, uh, speaking to us live, I believe, from Washington. Uh, and then we're going to uh, do a Q&A in the last 15 minutes of our hour with him. So people here in the audience, you'll have an opportunity to ask him a question if I'm sure you're going to have questions come up during this thing. And uh, for those that are here on the live stream, thank you for tuning in. Um, we'll also have questions coming from you. You can participate through the chat on this thing. Um, yeah, and I would just like to, to thank one person in particular, uh, which is Jordan Thornquest. He's kind of behind the scenes. He's the man behind the curtain doing everything that's made this whole thing possible. He was the first person to suggest this, uh, this whole thing. Uh, earlier this year. I didn't take it very seriously at first, but as time went on, it really started to make sense. This is something that we need to do. Okay, so I'll just introduce our guest, uh, Dar Jamel. Get out my notes. Okay. All right, so I've spoken with Dar previously. I actually featured a segment of our interview that we had earlier this year in my TEDx talk. I think it really added a lot of weight to what I was discussing in that talk. So uh, in late 2003, weary of the overall failure of the US media to accurately report on the realities of the war in Iraq for the Iraqi people, Dar Jamil went to the Middle East to report on the war himself, where he has spent more than one year in Iraq as one of the as one of only a few independent U.S. journalists in the country. Dar has also reported from Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. He has also reported extensively on veterans' resistance against U.S. foreign policy. It has now focused on anthropogenic climate disruption and the environment. Dar's stories have been published with Truthout, Interpress Service, Tom's, Tom Dispatch, The Sunday Herald in Scotland, The Guardian, Foreign Policy in Focus, Le Monde, the Huffington Post, The Nation, The Independent, and Al Jazeera, among others. On radio as well as television, Dar has reported for Democracy Now! and Al Jazeera, and has appeared on the BBC, NPR, and numerous other stations around the world. Uh, Dar's reporting has earned him numerous awards, excuse me, uh, including the 2008 Martha Gellhorn Award for Journalism, the Lannan Foundation Writing Reg Residency Fellowship, the James Aronson Award for Social Justice Journalism, the Joe A. Calloway Award for Civic Courage, and five Project Censored Awards. In Dar's upcoming book, The End of Ice, Bearing Witness, and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption, Dar embarks on a journey to the geographical front lines of the global climate crisis from Alaska to Australia's barrier reef via the Amazon forest, rainforest, in order to discover the consequences to nature and to humans of the loss of ice. Howard Zinn describes him, he is a superb journalist in the most honorable tradition of that craft. Dar, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Patrick. Good to be with you, and thanks for the great, very warm introduction. Yeah. Well, I just lifted that from your website. I think that was, a, <laughs> you know, a good introduction for uh, for who you are and what you've done. Um, 
We've got a couple people here walking in. Hey, Paul. <laughs> hey, Arnell. <laughs> All right, so I think to start off this uh, discussion, I think it's important to lay out um, kind of the context. So you use a term when you uh, do your climate dispatches. So you write regularly for Truth Out. You provide pretty regular updates of what's going on regarding abrupt climate disruption. You use that term very specifically, abrupt climate disruption, versus a more broad term like global warming or climate change. Uh, what exactly do you mean by using the term abrupt climate disruption? Right. I, I kind of interchangeably between abrupt climate disruption and anthropogenic, which means human caused climate disruption. And I moved back to the United States from writing about climate change overseas for Al Jazeera English. And coming into the United States specifically, I felt like I needed to be as scientifically accurate as possible, given the power of the fossil fuel industry, the lobby groups and the influence on the media and how they had essentially um, kind of slickly uh, cast, managed to use the words climate change to kind of cast out kind of that uh, nonsensical, well, climate is always changing. So it was basically an effort of just being as, as scientifically accurate as possible. So I, you know, anthropogenic human cause, that's clear, uh, climate disruption, because what we've done is disrupted the climate of the planet. In some areas you might see even colder temperatures. Of course, overall, as the planet warms, uh, that's what we're seeing. But essentially, we've we've kind of, uh, to use an analogy, we've kind of thrown the climate into a, a bit of fibrillation. And so it's disrupted. It's not only warm. Sometimes it's going to be colder. So that was basically just my effort to be as, as scientifically accurate as possible. Right. That reminds me of, I think, a Senator Inhofe a few years ago came to the, I think it was the Senate, a uh, big climate change denier, brought a snowball, because it was winter, brought it into the Senate, threw it, and uh, was trying to basically say, so much for global warming, right? You know, we don't have seasons anymore, obviously. Um, I think that kind of level of, of simplification and um, denialism is, a, it, it's, it's still common, but I think as the climate, like you mentioned, is becoming much more... Um, it's disruptive. I mean, we're seeing more severe hurricanes, uh, more severe uh, situations with wildfires. Um, you can go on down the list and see the erratic nature of abrupt climate change, as you uh, point out in your work. And I want to point to something. There, there have been several stories that have come out more recently uh, regarding the subject. Um, you know, the IPCC, which stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and that is a UN body of scientists, and they release a report every few years. They just released a report within the last month or so, I believe. Um, I just want to quote, this is the, from the press release, okay? This is discussing the differences between a, say, 1.5 C to, say, a 2 degree C uh, global average temperature rise. Uh, so this is just from the press release. The IPCC just released a report. Uh, the report highlights a number of climate change impacts that could be avoided by limiting global warming to 1.5 C compared to 2 degrees centigrade or more. Uh, for instance, by 2100, global sea level rise would be 10 centimeters lower with global warming of 1.5 degrees C compared to, with 2 degrees C. The likelihood of an Arctic Ocean free of sea ice in summer would be once per century with global warming of 1.5 C compared with at least once per decade with two degrees centigrade. Uh, coral reefs would decline by 70 to 90 percent with global warming of 1.5 C, whereas virtually all 99 percent uh, would be lost with a two degree centigrade uh, rise in temperature. Uh, every extra bit of warming matters, especially since warming of 1.5 C or higher increases the risk associated with long-lasting or irreversible changes, such as the loss of some ecosystems, said Hans Otto Portner, the co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2. So the thing about the IPCC and what I kind of understand is that it's a pretty conservative report, and even for as conservative as it is, it's still quite dire. Um, what is your opinion on that report? What, what do you make of the comparisons between 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade in temperature? Um, well, uh, 
I, I would echo what you just said. I've written about how the IPCC, and this is e even coming from people who are authors of IPCC reports and studies, and their main climate assessments come out every seven years. Um, the thing about this report that I think people need to understand that as, as alarming and dire as it is, that there's nothing new in it. Uh, they didn't generate any new information. They basically just took what they already had and put it together in a way to try to resound the alarm that they had hoped previous reports had sounded, which is the absolute necessity to try to aim to limit warming to 1.5 C as opposed to 2 C or 4 C, which is the trajectory we're currently on because there is a massive, massive difference in global implications between 1.5 C warming and 2 C warming, as you just read. So as dire as those are, I just want to reiterate that um, this is basically um, science by committee, if you will, in the, the IPCC. This is very old data. Some of it's more than 10 years old that they're using to make these projections and assessments. And then when they take all that data into their reports, it's an extremely politicized body. So when you have a country like the United States is going to come in and of course lobby with everything they're worth to go with the least severe uh, ramifications of this data instead of really showing um, what, what could happen and warn, warning against the worst case scenario. And this is why specifically every IPCC assessment that's come out um, reality has actually outpaced its worst case future projections. So as we catch up with what they had projected for the year 2000 or the year 2010 or coming up to 2020, we're actually ahead of all their previous worst case projections. And that's a trend that I, I fully expect us to continue into the future. And not just me, but some of the authors of IPCC, IPCC reports whom I've interviewed. Right. And something they mentioned in this, uh, just the part that I quoted here, they discuss in uh, an Arctic, uh, an ice-free Arctic. And um, from what I could tell, just based on the graphs that come out every year, uh, that sea ice extent just diminishes um, pretty dramatically. Um, could you please explain um, the significance, I, I guess maybe to frame this, using the term canary in the coal mine, right? something that's really sounding the alarm that we should really use as an indication that uh, the climate is radically changing. The Arctic is a very good example. Um, if you could please discuss the danger of having a uh, little to no ice in the Arctic region, it'd be great. Well, we, we are on track. The most recent graphs that we have, including data from this year show, the, pr the current projection is that uh, we're set up to start having ice-free periods in the summer of Arctic sea ice uh, within about five years from right now. Um, and, and it could be sooner, but the current projections, looking at trends and, and minimum extents and minimum volumes, et cetera, show it to be happening, beginning to happen within five years from right now. Um, what why so many people are fixated on Arctic sea ice, myself included, is because <clears throat> there's there's several very, very worrisome things that are set to happen once that's gone. And we're already actually seeing them start to happen, but that they, they will only accelerate when there's periods of no Arctic sea ice in the summer. The first and most important, I feel, is that that sea ice is basically reflecting back sunlight and the heat with it uh, from um, going down into the water and getting into the shallow seas and warming them up to a point where the um, massive amounts of methane hydrates that are frozen into that subsea permafrost. Once that starts melting and those get released, methane is a hundred times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide on a 10 year time scale. And it's still 20 times as potent on a hundred year time scale. And once that methane starts getting released on moss, then we're essentially replicating the key extinction driver during the Permian mass extinction 252 million years ago, which wiped out 90% of all life on Earth, most of it in the oceans. And we are, as I said, on track to replicating that. Even this summer, 
Uh, we've seen lakes now in the Arctic that are literally bubbling because permafrost underneath them is melting and releasing methane that's coming up through the water. Other areas in subsea, we're already seeing releases. This has actually been happening for several years now, but it's now accelerating. So for this to happen across the Arctic, and especially once we have that sea ice completely gone for periods during the summer, then we're at grave risk of that happening all across the shallow seas of the Arctic. So that's number one. Number two, it shifts weather patterns globally, and it's also causing uh, things like, you know, as Greenland melts and as that steady trend of overall melting in Greenland is, is continuing, of course, it vacillates year to year, but overall we see a consistent downward trend as far as, well, as far as increasing melting uh, with Greenland. And then that's causing a disruption of the Atlantic Mariel Dianal Ocean Circulation Current, the AMOC, which is a giant circulating current uh, from the Atlantic. And as that slows down, that is going to affect weather patterns dramatically, particularly in um, northwestern Europe and, and northern Europe. Uh, so, so there's going to be major weather pattern shifts. And along with that comes um, rainfall patterns shifting across the globe. So food, food supplies are going to be impacted, et cetera. And, and that's still a very cursory glance, but that gives you an idea of how important it is that the sea ice uh, remain intact. And the unfor of unfortunate reality that we're looking at is that it is on its way out. And the things that I described are uh, appearing to be inevitable. Um, it, it's just, I think it's just a question of when. Right. It is a question of when, but it does seem like this is, a, this is coming up within our lifetimes. You know, oftentimes we project this out into, oh, this is 2100, or this is gonna be our grandchildren that are gonna have to deal with this, uh, this problem. Uh, this is happening right now. This is manifesting right now. I think oftentimes when you read about climate change in any report, in any mainstream publication, it's projected into the future. Uh, but we're starting to see those effects play out in the present. I mean, we have wild, wildfires that are breaking records every year here in the, nor in the uh, North American continent. Um, we're seeing wildfires up in the Arctic uh, Circle. Is that right? That's right. And that's, um, I, I guess maybe to point on this, I think we, we as human beings have a hard time cognitively understanding uh, exponential change or nonlinear change. Uh, we tend to think very linear, linearly about these things, like it's going to gradually warm, things are gradually going to change, we're going to have gradual sea rise. Um, that's how we, in an evolutionary sense, understand this information. Um, but what is disturbing is that we are, we are not cognitively capable, it seems, um, at least initially, uh, to understand the very rapid change that is happening and how quickly that's going to cause massive societal change, um, you know, collapse of infrastructure, the inability to get something like food, uh, the way our whole agricultural system, uh, our whole socioeconomic system is structured. Uh, we will not be able to have access to things that we absolutely rely upon like grain, right? Like so much of our food comes from that particular source. Um, yeah, if you just had a comment on, on uh, exponential change and, uh, you know, pointing to what we discussed with the Arctic, but like understanding how rapidly this is going to play out. Um, if you can give us some kind of understanding of that, that'd be great. I think that's a very important point. And I think I can share a story that will really help illustrate it. Um, um, and I, I share this with some humility because I thought, given all the research that I do and have done about climate change, for my book for the right for truth out, I felt like I had a very deep knowing of, yes, all these things that we've been talking about in the future, they're already starting to happen now. I get that. Um, but I didn't, I, I under something happened actually this summer that kind of underscored that I didn't really get it. And I think it's because until something happened directly to me that was overtly climate related, that needed to happen for it to sink in. And what happened was I was writing about this. I had done so much research for my book, pulled it all together. And again, I was confronted with a lot of despair and grief and depression. And so I took a couple of days off work 
I, I took some mental health days and I went to go climb a mountain in the Cascades, which late summer, Pacific Northwest, one would think um, wildfires and wildfire smoke might not be such a big issue. So I went into the mountains to seek solace. And while I was there, I was going to stay two nights, but, but wildfire smoke from British Columbia and Eastern Washington and Montana was so bad and started coming in so thick, literally billowing in like clouds that I could see. And uh, I've had respiratory problems in the past. I literally, uh, I, I texted uh, a dear friend of mine um, back home in Port Townsend, which is on the water near the coast. And I said, is there any smoke there? Because if not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bail early on this trip and come home. And she said, nope, it's, it's clear. And so I, I literally had to pack up after the climb and instead of staying the extra night and lounging and enjoying the, the solitude of the mountains and reading a book, I, I, I came home and I drove for three hours west. And, and it took almost that entirety of getting all the way basically to just north of Seattle until I emerged back out of the smoke. Um, and, and it really got me, you know, that, that that's what it's like, you know, when the world is burning and, and you're surrounded by smoke everywhere and you have sensitive respiratory condition and you can't afford to be in that. And then I also got how lucky and privileged I am that I could just leave and then go to a place where there wasn't smoke. So that, but that really kind of underscored it for me as well as then knowing that, all these people who in California and Oregon, who their, their fires, their, I'm sorry, their houses have burnt down. You know, for them, there's nothing theoretical about this anymore. People in Bangladesh, millions of people that as we speak are having to relocate and find ways to move to higher ground because they live on the biggest river delta in the world and it's flooding because of sea level rise and river floods. Um, there's nothing theoretical to them. You know, the wildfires, you know, the people in the panhandle of Florida, or in the Carolinas from the hurricanes this summer who've lost everything. There's nothing theoretical in future about it anymore to them. Right. And I think this is kind of the thing we, we exist. We live here within the United States It's still technically considered a first world nation, although maybe we're, <laughs> that's <laughs> changing. Uh, it seems, um, but <laughs> it seems like the most vulnerable people in the world, the poorest people in the world are the ones that are the, the first to be affected by this. Um, yeah, it's all coming back though. I think um, was it was it hens coming home to roost? That kind of is that chickens coming coming home to roost? Chickens, yeah. yeah, chickens coming home to roost, and I I really think it is. And and no matter where we live now, um, even even in the so called bubble that a lot of the U.S. has been for a long time, um, none of us are impervious anymore. And I think with time, that's only going to continue to become that much more dramatically apparent. And, and, and one thing that I, I would add, you know, since we really started this talking about this recent IPCC report is there's a very good Wallace Wells who he had an article come out about it because a lot of what we talk about is these degree changes, but a lot of the time um, people don't really understand the global implications of what it means. And so I, um, citing him and him authoring this piece that was published in New York Magazine um, very shortly after the IPCC report that we just spoke about came out, I thought I would read um, a few paragraphs because he he really puts it very succinctly and very materially what, what each of these degree changes look like. Um, bearing in mind, we're at about 1.12 C global warming right now. Um, there's this talk about limiting it, trying to limit it to 1.5 C rather than 2 C, um, while bearing in mind right now we are on a trajectory to hit 4 C by 2100, if nothing changes. And of course, it does appear as though there's not going to be any dramatic changes to curtail that from happening. So, so now reading what he wrote, at 2 C, the melting ice sheets will pass a tipping point of collapse, flooding dozens of the world's major cities this century. At that amount of warming, it's estimated global GDP per capita will be cut by 13%. 400 million more people will suffer from water scarcity. And even in the northern latitudes, heat waves will kill thousands each summer. It will be worse in the planet's equatorial band. 
in India, where many cities now numbering in the many millions will become unlivably hot, and there will be 32 times as many heat waves, each lasting five times as long and exposing in total 93 times more people. That's at two degrees, practically speaking, our absolute best case climate scenario. At three degrees, Southern Europe will be in permanent drought. The average drought in Central America will last 19 months and in the Caribbean, 21 months. In North Africa, the figure is 60 months, that's five years. The area is burned each year by wildfires would double in the Mediterranean and sextuple in the United States. Beyond the sea level rise, which will already be swallowing cities from Miami Beach to Jakarta, damages just from river flooding will grow 30-fold in Bangladesh, 20-fold in India, and as much as 60-fold in the UK. This is three degrees, better than we'd do if all the nations in the world honored their Paris commitments, which none of them are. Practically speaking, barring those dramatic tech de machina, this seems to me about as positive a realistic outcome as it is rational to expect. At four degrees, there would be eight million cases of dengue fever each year in Latin America alone. Global grain yields could fall by as much as 50%, producing annual or close to annual food crises. The global economy would be more than 30% smaller than it would be without climate change, and we would see at least half again as much conflict and warfare as we do today, possibly more. Our current, current trajectory, remember, takes us higher still, and while there are many reasons to think we will bend that curve soon, the plummeting cost of renewable energy, the growing global consensus about phasing coal, out coal, it is worth remembering that whatever you may have heard about the green revolution and the price of solar at present, global carbon emissions are still growing. That's a good rundown. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And so let me just be a good devil's advocate because people I'm sure are thinking, well, are there geoengineering schemes that we can possibly throw at this? Can we uh, uh, capture all that extra excess carbon that we've produced over the past several centuries of, of uh, you know, industrialization? Uh, and, you know, can we po would that possibly be a solution? Is there, is there anything that's happening regarding that that you know of? There is currently no technology available that is scalable to a level that would be required to pull as much CO2 out of the atmosphere as possible to uh, uh, prevent us going into uh, basically anything over 2C. Um, there's the one thing I've come across that would be feasible but this would require literally all global governments going into reacting together as though we we're being invaded by hostile aliens. Um, something you'd see out of a sci-fi movie, like we're going to mandate that all government resources now go into stopping emitting CO2 immediately while simultaneously basically re, re fertilizing, recarbonizing soils, planting as many trees as possible using nature to basically do what nature does and pulling carbon back out of the atmosphere. Stop all deforestation, stop all burning, um, and, and actively work to begin re-enriching soils to reabsorb the carbons that they we've, you know, current industrial farming practices have been depleting them of for decades now. If that were scalable on a global level, and that's one thing that obviously the technology is there and we know how to do it and we could do it rapidly. But, and this is the kicker, but that would require every global government getting on board with it, i.e., you know, the current modality, which is fossil fuel based. And, you know, basically all of every Western economy would have to be abandoned overnight for that to happen. And, and, and we see instead going the other trajectory of um, people voting in or or like what just happened in Brazil, literally, uh, it's came out just minutes before we started talking that uh, they've elected essentially the tropical Trump, uh, a madman right wing uh, uh, who's who's a threat to the democracy, let alone has already talked about mining the Amazon and paving the Amazon and things like this. So instead of what I just described about this rush to 
Um, if we're going to have a chance at saving humans and, and numerous other species around the globe by uh, doing something like what I outlined, uh, we appear to be going, uh, well, stomping on the gas, so to speak. Yeah, I just uh, pulled up a thing. It, it reminded me of a article that actually came on the Washington Post. Uh, the headline is, Trump administration sees a seven degree, and they're saying that in Fahrenheit, seven degree rise in global temperatures by 2100. And the article just goes over how the scientists that work within the Trump administration are fully aware that climate change is real, that it's anthropogenic, it's human caused, and yet they're going full force. They're get, you know, re and they're trying to get the coal industry back in shape. You know, uh, uh, you know, when Trump came in, he started selling off portions of national parks so that they could do mining and uh, fracking and other various extractions. Um, it just sort of exposes the absolutely cynical and psychopathic nature of the institutions that we have and the individuals that exist within them. And um, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's like it's really hard to know what direction to go in, um, where to put your energy, because it seems that the forces that be, or the the powers that be, as it were, are are very powerful, and they have their interests in mind, and they're going to continue to do that. I mean, and it doesn't matter what side you can call yourself Democrat or Republican or conservative or liberal, but you know your options for voting. I mean, you have either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but. We know that, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly, I want to say it was Hillary Clinton, but I could be wrong, but um, when it was discussed that the Arctic is melting, uh, that was opening up uh, uh, shipping um, routes, right? And, and they were talking about it in a very, like, this is great for business. Like, we can continue to move resources around in a much more efficient way I think that the climate crisis, and I'm speaking for myself, but I think when you start to really get into it and really grapple with the information, it really speaks to something much deeper than just the climate system. Um, we have an ecological crisis on this planet. The living systems of this planet are being threatened and undermined by the systems that we are a part of, that we perpetuate, that we participate in in some fashion, even if we are fully aware of how destructive it is. And so my point in this, I guess, this presentation is to get you to think a little outside of even your comfort zone or outside of the box of what you think uh, meaningful action is in this time. Because what you're pointing to, Dar, and what so many other people are now pointing to, I mean, this is appearing in pretty conservative publications, mainstream publications that, you know, we're coming up against some pretty serious uh, crises here. And the implications are, you know, massive loss of life, not just human life, but life, period. And you discuss the last major extinction event in which uh, all that methane was released. 90% of life was destroyed in that. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be alive in this time that we're in? And, and I know that's something that you grapple with while you're researching the scientific information. You're a human being, Dar. All of us are human. We're trying to grapple with this information, whether it's new to us or not. Um, you know, you talk about going and you, you wanted to go um, uh, scale a mountain to sort of clear your mind. You can't even escape it there anymore. So, you know, you're, you're neck deep in this information all the time. You, I know we're not going to talk about it too much, but you have a book coming out in January dealing with this information. You know, how do you stay grounded in this time that we're in? No, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I think, you know, as, as we talk about all of this really challenging information and, and what it means for us and the rest of the planet. You know, I, I think the first thing I think I, I just urge people watching and listening to take it in that, you know, this is our reality and really let yourself accept that this is happening. You know, this is not a, a crazy sci-fi movie or book, but this is really, you know, we have caused this and this is the result of our actions or inactions. And, and this is happening now. And then second to that, and immediately alongside that really is, is dealing with the feelings. Like what I talked about is I, I, I go into the mountains and seek solace because I get up in there and I get perspective and can put my hands on rocks or a tree and okay, this is real. 
you know, like that, no matter what happens, that mountain's been here way before we were, and it's going to be here way after we're gone, no matter what happens. And, and that calms me down, you know, and I think each of us needs to, but also, you know, feel that rage, feel that sadness, the fear, the anxiety, and, and, and have all the feelings that come with this. I mean, we're talking about the potential extinction of, of our own species, let alone uh, animal species, plant uh, species, I- insects, things like this. And um, this is, this is utterly massive. And I think we have to acknowledge that and, and let that sink in and, and then, and then find other people that we can talk to about this, which is becoming easier. As you said, this, this one thing that's happened over this last year is things are happening so fast and becoming so much more intense that it does feel like this is becoming more and more common in even even mainstream media. I mean, you have even the Trump administration has acknowledged, okay, yeah, it's real. They they won't acknowledge how much humans are responsible, but oh, it's it's this is happening. That it's become even un, that part of it's become undeniable even to them. And so we have to understand that. And then and then I think it's. At that point, it feels like, I mean, I get into some of my own personal specifics and some other stories around that more in depth in the book uh, that's going to be coming out. But I think it puts all of us in a position like any crisis would, where, you know, we have to get really real about what's really, really important and then make decisions from that place. And and for me personally, it means... Um, living with with that much more reverence toward the earth that, you know, to know that I, this is where I came from. You know, I I came from this planet and this is where I live and this is my place. And I still personally feel um, very responsible for taking as good a care of it as I can. And then trying to figure out, well, how can I do that amidst this overwhelming, this global crisis that, that it is overwhelming and I have to boil that down and make things extremely local. Um, you know, how do I keep reducing my carbon footprint on a, on an annual basis? I, I live in a solar powered house. I'm growing the majority of my own food now and, and doing things like that. And do I do it because I think it's going to stop us from going over 2C warming or reaching 4C or 5C or worse? No, I don't because I don't think it will. But uh, it's the moral thing to do, and it's the right thing to do, and and that's that's some of the things that I've personally started to do, and and um, um, trying to withhold as much judgment as I can on on myself and those actions. But it just seems to me like that's still the right and honorable thing to do for the planet, even though we've already really, uh, you know, baked, so to speak. You know, it's. We've already baked, um, you know, this much change into the system. I mean, another way that I I put it when, excuse me, time is short is, you know, that when I, when I talk to people about, oh, well, can we still change this or what can we do? Well, the oceans, and I think we talked about this on, on your podcast previously, Patrick, the oceans have absorbed 93% of the heat that we've put into the atmosphere. That's enough heat that if the oceans didn't exist, the atmosphere would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is today. My point is, whatever we do to the soil or whatever kind of geoengineering is employed, et cetera, you do not remove that heat from the oceans. And that's locked in and that's causing bleaching of the coral reefs. It's continuing to acidify. That's causing, that's actually the brunt of what's driving the majority of the melting now in the Antarctic ice shelf, specifically the Western Antarctic ice shelf, including the Arctic sea ice, it's, it's the hot water. And so um, we're, we're locked in now and this is coming. I just think that underscores um, all the more the relevance of this question of, okay, so, you know, it's, I think it's less, what do we do and more, how do I be? Right. (laughs) I guess that's why I wanted to actually have this kind of discussion because I tried to tackle this a little bit in in a nine and a half minute talk. 
um, which you can't do. <laughs> right. You can uh, you can hit some of the major data points in the beginning and then try to talk about, you know, how to live in this time. You know, and it's interesting. You talked about when you went to the uh, the mountains to kind of find solace and and there it became very personal to you. And I think all of us have to ask, like, when does it become personal to us? When does it actually become real? And how are we going to behave in that time when it does become real? You know, I, I think that what's interesting is, and people use this almost as like a way to disparage people who believe in climate change. Like, oh, you know, Al Gore was preaching this shit back in 2007 or something or whatever that documentary came out. Um, and, you know, he's a billionaire, millionaire, whatever, and probably flies on private jets. So how can you really take him very seriously? But, you know, the way that he, you know, when he gets to the end, he says, this is sea level rise. Here's all this information. You know, you can go out and get some solar panels. You can start to keep track of how much carbon you've released driving around the city and try to reduce that. You can buy, you know, more efficient light bulbs. <laughs> what it does is it tries to individualize action, right? I think that that's kind of the thing as we exist within a socioeconomic paradigm, which says that you are, you know, you pull yourself by your bootstraps, you figure this out. And if all of us can just do that on an individual level, then we can figure this out. That's not what this crisis is asking of us, though. It stands in the face of those cultural values. It's asking us to come together as a community, almost. I feel like if there's any meaningful action, it's in being with each other. Whether or not we know we can fix this or not, right? Like, we may know that we're going to be meeting our, our ext extinction, but still, is it still a worthy act to undermine oppressive systems? You know, is it still a worthy act to try to undermine um, ways of thinking and feeling in the world that are destructive to other forms of life besides our own? I think it still is. And I, I think that the climate crisis is actually asking us something. And it's not just the climate crisis, because like I pointed to, the ecological crisis more, more broadly, the climate crisis speaks to something that's happening within us internally as well as individuals and as a collective, how detached we've become from the planet. You know, I, I, one indication that was interesting people have brought up is, have you noticed that the bug splatter on your windshield has diminished the past few years? It used to be like, you'd have a huge amount of bugs just splattered on your windshield. Now it's less than half of that. You know, what does that mean? And that's not just climate change, that's the kind of chemicals we're using to kill off certain undesirable pests or plants as we monoculture this planet to f feed cattle and you know, all this other stuff, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there's just so much to unpack uh, with all this information, but I think we did a really good job in this about 45 minutes or so that we've talked. And I'm sure that, I, I hope at least, some people have some questions that maybe have come up during this discussion. Um, and, uh, hey, Jordan, hey, <laughs> do you want people to stand in the middle there? Or how do you want to do that regarding that? Patrick, you know, one, one thing I'll put out there while folks are maybe getting lined up there is that just struck me is that I think one reason this is such a challenging thing to talk about and that there aren't any canned answers that we can cover in nine minutes or 42 minutes or anything else is, is that this is a new point in our evolution as a species. You know, we're, we're aware of what we've done and we're aware of what's coming. And so um, I think we have to evolve with this now and, and kind of make it up as we go along and try stuff that works and try stuff that doesn't work and then learn from that is – I, I feel like this is a new point in our own evolution, both psychologically, philosophically, and spiritually. And I think that's that's you know to mean that there aren't gonna there isn't gonna be just one answer. It's gonna be very individual, but also collective at the same time. I just wanted to put that out there, you know. So there's you know the um, I think most of the most of the questions are gonna continue to be open ended, as are most of the answers. Right, I think it's good to learn how to be somewhat comfortable in knowing there aren't answers to certain questions or certain yeah, dilemmas. Yeah. I think maybe it's it's a cultural thing, but we we think if there's a problem, we have to find a way to fix it. You know, can we can we engineer our way out of this problem? And I think a lot of it also is because we exist within a complex society, 
we have certain individuals or certain groups of individuals that have enormous amount of power, we assume that somebody's going to fix this for us. Elon Musk is going to fix this for us. You know, he's going to launch us into space and we're going to be able to live on Mars. Isn't that amazing? Like it, we try to imagine that there's going to be some sort of techni technology fix uh, to this. And um, I think we need to get a, a handle on it and, and acknowledge and sort of exist within a space of unknowing not knowing what's coming, not knowing even what's really happening. You know, I, I think when you analyze the climate, and this has actually been something that I would say maybe people that are call themselves skeptical or, or um, in a state of denial about it, is the, cl the, the climate is so complex that we cannot possibly understand what's happening. And that's true to a degree. As, as we begin to experience this change, there are variables that were not considered in the initial research. Right, we don't. We're really just starting to understand it, but we do have enough percept. We can perceive just well enough to know that this is happening, and it's not good for us. So, yeah, I, I think that that my note would be um, would be that. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I thank you for sharing that that last thought and jumping in there. We'll see if we got any people. Uh, People in the group chat, if you want to jump in and ask a question, we'll do that. If anybody here in the audience, I don't know if anybody here has a question. I hope. <laughs> oh. Okay. Where's it at? Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Is there anybody that's got a question? Got a question, Bowen? You want to come on up here, please? Perfect. Go ahead and just state your name and your question. All right. Hey, Dar, uh, thank you for, uh, for chatting with us. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Bowen. I'm, I'm the uh, reporter who interviewed you uh, a couple oh, hey, of days Bowen. ago. Yeah, yeah, good to meet you. I, um, I, so I, I'm just curious, um, are there any other books or, um, or other articles that you would recommend seeking out um, to, to further our education on this uh, subject? Oh, goodness. Wow, there's so many. Um, you know, one, the first book that comes to mind is Elizabeth Colbert's Six Mass Extinction, which came out quite, a, you know, a few, not too long ago, a few years ago. But that's a that's a really important book that kind of gives you an idea of, of what's happening to species, including our own around the world. And of course, it's climate related. Um, Another really good one about the Arctic and specifically the sea ice is Dr. Peter Wadhams, mm -hmm. whom I've interviewed several times. He has a book that came out, I, I believe Penguin published it uh, two, three years ago called Farewell Ice. Okay. Um, and it's, he's, he's arguably the most renowned Arctic sea ice expert on the planet. And that's a really, really good book as far as that goes. And then for articles, uh, the, the the person who uh, uh, that I, I read that bit from, David Wallace Wells, who's written for uh, New York Magazine, um, and he has another piece that raised, uh, well, caused some very big waves earlier this year when he basically wrote about what it, what happens on Earth with if if all the worst case scenarios come true, which is possible. It's not guaranteed, but it's it's certainly possible, and it's a and it's extremely apocalyptic. Uh, and at the time, he caught a lot of flack and was heavily criticized for being alarmist and scaring people. But now, I think it's roughly a year later since that article, article came out. And now it seems notably less far-fetched. Mm. And it's a, it's a challenging one to read and that it is very scary. But I think it's an important article. So there's those. And then at the risk of being shamelessly self-promoting, um, I write a monthly climate, I call it a climate disruption dispatch for Truthout. It's truthout.org. We publish it every Monday. I have one that will publish tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what I do is daily, I'm collating the most recent scientific studies and reports, as well as extreme weather events that are clearly tied to climate disruption, at least in some part, which all of them are now. Um, and I, I pull it all together. I usually introduce it with, <clears throat> excuse me, a personal story. Mm -hmm. And then um, um, that's all. That's basically a way that people can, once a month, you're going to have the most updated 
studies that have come out because there's so many, they're all around the world. It's a difficult, and, and I don't pretend to keep up with all of them, but you know, every month it's 2,500 to 3000 words of, you know, here's where we're at. This is what's happened in the last 30 days. Mm -hmm. So those are, that's probably enough to, um, have you read and probably need to get a psychologist, uh, to get started. <laughs> Great. Thank you for the recommendations. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm the moderator. Don't mind me. I'm just pulling up some questions from the chat. I've got a couple that people have been asking. The biggest one is uh, when your book is coming out and where they can get it. Yeah, the book's called The End of Ice, uh, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. It's going to be published by the New Press. And it will be, it's coming out January 15th. And it uh, you can pre-order it now um, through all the usual ways, directly through the New Press website, Amazon, uh, et cetera. Excellent, thanks a bunch. I had a great question from Antonio Reed. He's in the chat. I hope I got your name right, Antonio. He said, uh, what are your thoughts on the immigrant caravan? Immigrant caravan? Is this a sign of what's coming in the future? And do you think it will turn violent? Um, I can't speak as to whether it will turn violent unless they, you know, they're still weeks away from the U.S. border. I, if it turned violent, it would be because U.S. soldiers decided to start firing on them, probably. I don't think the violence would come from the car caravan. I'd be shocked if it did. Um, but I see this as very directly correlated to climate disruption as so much of the violence across the Middle East and the, the migrations that we're seeing there now. Um, if you look at the climate models and NASA's projections, Central America, uh, it's, it's becoming increasingly challenging because of droughts, floods, and extreme weather events uh, for agriculture to continue as, as normal there. And that's pushed more and more people into the cities looking for other jobs, which is causing these gangs and violence and instability, which is causing people to try to migrate to some place where there's just basic security and uh, they can just get food and water. It always comes down to that. So unfortunately, I think the, the, this caravan is symptomatic of that. And I think that we would have, um, I don't know if it'd be in the form of caravans, but certainly bigger and more consistent migrations of people both north and south out of Central America. Because if you look at the climate modeling by 2100, um, if you look at the worst case predict, uh, 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 projections, Basically, Central America is just drought alone. Um, it's it, agriculture. It's it's going to be really, really challenging to grow much of anything there. Not even to talk about um, the, the the kind of drought, flooding, extreme weather event combo that itself is kind of the terrible triad for agriculture. So, um, I, I think absolutely uh, this is a, a tip of the iceberg situation. Unfortunately, thanks a bunch. Yeah, let's grab anyone in the audience. Yeah, come on up, man. <clears throat> Hi, Dar. I'm Victor. Um, Hi, Victor. I was curious when you talked about the mountain trip and trying to clear your head, um, the whole <laughs> dealing with this, researching this stuff, and how much of a toll that took on you to have to do that. I'm curious can, if you could describe a little more of what that is like to live like that day to day to go through this stuff and how tough it is to uh, on you on you personally. Uh, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, um, personally, I, I walk a very fine line of things that I need to do to kind of keep a balance between, you know, the very, the, the, the weight and the gravity of what I'm writing about regarding the climate and, and, you know, other things like this political catastrophe that's also happening across the U S and now, you know, Brazil and other, other places around the world, you know, balancing that, which, you know, not just me as a writer, but I think anyone that's really consistently consuming the news pretty steadily on a daily basis is going to have to deal with this. And so, um, you know, it's, it's time with really, really good friends and it's talking about this stuff on a regular basis with people that also see clearly what's going on and the ramifications of it. Um, and and I, I bring up the mountain trip because uh, if, if I can't get to the mountains it's very important for me to go out into the garden and get my hands in the dirt and look at the trees and just be in the trees and with the trees and hear the birds and just, just daily connection to the planet, just to kind of ground like a, a lightning rod, if you will, because 
if I don't do that stuff and I, after my first big book trip a couple of years ago, I came back from Alaska and just went right into writing and pulling a lot of really intense information together about what was happening in Alaska. And I, I stopped doing the earth connection. Um, and, uh, within about three weeks was heavily depressed. So I, you know, it's consistently time with friends and time on the planet. And, uh, I really can't afford to let up on, on any of that stuff. Um, as well as, um, you know, I personally have a spiritual practice that involves daily meditation and, and some other things. And I have to really be diligent about that too. Otherwise it's just really easy to spin out. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. All right. Jordan, help me figure out how to check out the chat. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I got a question from Rob Simetz, and, and I know Rob. I, he's become a friend of mine. Uh, Rob asked, Dar, I am going to be a father in three months, and what I constantly think about is how to explain this to my son. Have you ever talked to kids about climate change, and how do we talk to children about this? That is a very good, very important, very hard question. Um, I, I do not have kids. I chose not to have my own kids. Um, I've not talked to real young kids. I've, I've talked to, um, I think the youngest kids I've talked to about this are, are folks in their early 20s um, who pretty much already get it. You know, um, I or actually I did speak to uh, I spent time last week with a class from Evergreen, Evergreen State University, just south of here in Olympia. Um, you know, so some some 19 and 20 year olds and they all got it. I mean, that was one thing that I actually found refreshing is I found that, that most people in the younger generations, I mean, I guess unless they're you know studying to be corporate fascists, um, they really get it. They, they really get climate change, they get that we're in it deep and they, they get that the future is going to be very intense. Um, but particularly people with kids, um, I think it's going to be very important to explain to the child when the time is right. And I have no idea at what age or when that's going to be, but let them know what's happening and let them know that they're living in a rapidly changing world as well as why the decision was made to bring them in. You know, it was probably made because there's a lot of love and um, um, that wanted to be expressed in, in this form and that um, the parents probably still thought it was possible to do that even against the backdrop of um, um, this climate catastrophe that's upon us. And, you know, I guess one analogy I may, might make is that working in Iraq for as long as I did, uh, when times got extremely intense, like when Fallujah was sieged and hundreds of thousands of refugees streaming into Baghdad, what I saw is that alongside with the barbarism that comes out in war of horrible things being done by the occupation force Americans, um, but alongside that were uh, amazing acts of humanity that, you know, people just, you know, the, the, the love and the care, people just taking people into their homes that they didn't even know, sharing everything they had with them. That was actually far, far more common than looting and other negative things. And, and so I think there's going to be obviously a lot of room to, to practice that coming up. And I'm not trying to intentionally just put a silver lining on this thing, but I think that's another part of the equation that might help um, somehow when it comes to talking about um, children about that, but that's, that's a great question. And it's one that I, I definitely intend on exploring in the future, whether it's by interviewing psychologists or, uh, you know, but probably by talking with people who already have kids or have made the decision to have kids who are really handling it the right way. Thank you for that uh, question. And uh, thank you for that answer. Um, I think we'll do two more questions. If anybody in the audience has one right now, and then I'll do one more here on the live stream. Does anybody have a question? Okay. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Dar, and thank you, Patrick, for putting this performance on. Um, it's informational, and I think it's really important, but my question is, I, I understand that I can make a difference with climate change, and I'm not trying to diminish that, but I think that there's a disproportionate uh, percent that can make a difference. 
And I, I, recently there was an article, um, I, I don't know who it was or who, who wrote it, but it was multinational corporations and there may be like a hundred or so that are disproportionately responsible for our carbon emissions. And I, I know that I can make a difference personally, but I feel like maybe not changing or changing my actions, but maybe voting with my dollar and in influencing these corporations. And is, is this true? Is there a, a bigger percent out there that's the corporations causing this change versus individuals? And if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, unequivocally, that's the fact. Well, I, well for, for clarity, the single biggest CO2 emitter on the planet is the U.S. military. So that needs to be stated. Uh, second to that, I believe is The Guardian published an article within the last year and a half or so. And I think it was something like 17 corporations, 17 international corporations that were responsible for this. I'm not going to quote the percentage, but I think we can say the majority of the CO2 emissions and most of them obviously are fossil fuel companies. So uh, oil companies to be specific. So without a doubt, uh, finding out who and what those are. And Patrick, you alluded to this earlier, and then putting, making a concerted effort to try to stop that from happening in whatever way uh, necessary, whether it's voting with your dollars or organize, organizing a boycott campaign, et cetera, um, obviously would be a very fortuitous thing to do, I think. I do one more question here from the live chat. Uh, hey, Dar, thank you. Oh, this, by the way, is from Dominic. I think I know who this is. Uh, hey, Dar, thank you for this. What do you think indigenous perspectives can offer us in dealing with the climate disaster? Hmm. That is another excellent question. I actually uh, get into that at the end of my book uh, because I really struggle with how to end the book big time. I basically didn't know how. Uh, and, uh, and then a series of events happened that brought the indigenous perspective front and center in my life. So I'm not going to give away the ending of, my, ending of my book before it's released. But I think um, I, I don't think I can state uh, strongly enough that I think most, if not all of our answers to uh, how to have perspective on this and how to deal with it are going to come from indigenous populations around the world. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. All right, Dar, we have uh, approached our hour with you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. If you want to hang out for a second, I'll talk to you after we're, uh, after this, but uh, we're only halfway through this. Uh, the second half is going to be with Dr. Bones and it's going to get really weird. And <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you so much, Dar. I greatly appreciate this. This was difficult, I think, but um, I, I just, I admire you greatly for your work. And um, yeah, thank Likewise, you. Likewise, Patrick. Thanks a lot. I really thank appreciate you. it. Okay. okay. All right, guys, we'll take like a five to 10 minute intermission. Thank you so much. I'll play a couple songs and then we'll start back up. All right. Thank you.